yeah, I think it's time to start the next talk. And um, yeah, I'm happy to introduce you, Robin Wilson. And uh, Robin is a freelance geospatial data scientist and software developer. Uh, he also worked before as a remote sensing scientist. And um, yeah, he already released a number of open source Python packages. And today, Robin is going to talk uh, from static PDFs to interactive geospatial PDFs, or I never knew that PDFs could do that. That sounds really interesting. And Robin, the stage is yours and start your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening to you from, from the UK or good morning or good afternoon or good middle of the night, depending where you are in the world. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to talk all about PDFs and hopefully show you some things that you didn't realize PDFs could do. So let's just think about what PDFs are for a moment. Uh, if you've created a map using a GIS tool, you've probably exported a map as a PDF at some point. They're a very standard format for sharing these sort of map products in. And they're great for static documents, which have complex graphical layouts. And they're great because they're device independent. You can print them, they're a single file. They're really useful like that. And they're perfect for maps, except there's no way to get back to the original data. The original data has gone. It's just basically a vector image. Um, they're difficult to edit, and there's no kind of interactivity with them. At least that's what everyone thinks. And I'm here today to show you that this isn't necessarily the case, and that you can get all of these things, in fact, with a particular type of PDF called GeoPDFs. So let's switch straight away into a QGIS demo. Uh, do shout if you can't see QGIS, but I think I've shared my screen correctly. Uh, so this is QGIS. Um, it's a simple map that I created as part of the 30-day map challenge last year. I think this was the historical category. Uh, this is near where I live on the south coast of England. And uh, these are World War II airfields in an area called the New Forest. So you've got big airfields with their runways and smaller sort of decoy fields and grass landing strips in, in, um, in dots there. Now, if we have a look in QGIS, we can use the, um, the information tool to find out some information about something like Ridley Plain. It was a World War II decoy airstrip. There's a bit more information there. Uh, we can find some information about one of the runways uh, how long it is, what type of coverage it is, and, and so on. Now, if we go into a print layout, this is just a normal QGIS print layout. So we've got a legend, a title, scale, north arrow, all the things that your geography teacher told you that all maps should have. Um, and we want to export it as a PDF. So let's go to layer, export as PDF. And we can choose uh, where to export it called FOS4G. Now there's an item here you can choose, create geospatial PDF. You can tick that, you can just collapse it, you can just ignore all the rest of the options. We'll talk about those a bit later at the end if we've got some time. Um, but let's for the moment just tick create geospatial PDF and see what happens. If we click save, it will um, save our PDF and in a few moments, hopefully, it will um, tell us it's created it. Great. So if we open that up in, I'm on OS X here, so Mac OS X, if we open it up in the standard OS X preview application, we've got just a PDF that looks pretty normal. However, if we open it in some other applications that are a bit more powerful, we find we can actually do some more things with it. So let's open it up for the moment in Adobe Reader, Adobe Acrobat Reader, which is free software, but not open source in any way, uh, but it is freely available as in beer. Um, from the uh, Adobe website, and we can open this up, and you can see we've got our map here. Now we've got some more capabilities here. If we click the layers button on the left-hand side, you see we've got an entry for each of the layers that we had in our QGIS project. So we can turn off the background map or turn off the runways. Notice the legend doesn't change when we do this. The legend is just static um, vector images, so static images basically, uh, but we can turn on and off different layers quite useful if you've got quite a busy complex map and you want to give the user a certain amount of interactivity so they can see the aspects that are important to them. If you right click and choose object data tool, you can also start to actually query the data that's in the PDF. So if we click on this Ridley Plain airfield here, first of all, it highlights all of the items in that layer and says this is the airfields layer. 
we click on it again, it selects Ridley Plain in the left-hand side, and we can see here that it's the World War II decoy airstrip, it's categories decoy, and, and so on. Um, we can also select other things down here and go, okay, well, where's Limington Airfield? Oh, okay, it's over there. Or um, let's have a look at a runway. This particular runway here is over there, and it's 2.3 kilometers long. So we can start to query the underlying data in the PDF. We can also do a little bit more. If we go to tools here and go to measure, uh, we've got a geospatial location tool we can use. This basically shows a little uh, readout in the bottom right here of the latitude and longitude of your cursor. So you can move your cursor around and find out where you are. You can also measure distances. So you can say, okay, how far is it from there to there? Okay, it's 9.17 miles. Or how far is it from Denny Lodge to long down, that's 2.51 miles. And you can change the snapping type and measure areas and distances and, and so on. So this gives you a level of interactivity that people don't expect with PDFs. It doesn't require installing a separate application like QGIS or any sort of custom code, um, and is really easy to create from QGIS. But that's not all it can do. If we go into QGIS again and create a new project, we can add a vector layer and we can choose our phos4g.pdf and choose to add. It gives us a list of all the vector layers that were present within that PDF. Let's choose the runways option. Uh, let's accept the conversion of coordinate systems. And then if we just put a bit of background mapping on using quick map services to add a standard open street map, map uh, you can see that the runways are coming up in the right place. They're all correctly geographically located. Uh, if we select the runways and query one of them, you can see it's got all of its attribute data, length and type of runway concrete and, and so on. So we've got all the geographic data there come from the PDF. So the PDF is a store of this visualized data with this interactivity and with the underlying vector data stored in it as well. You can also even import it as a raster. So if you want to have the styled PDF on your QGIS project, you can do something like that and turn on OpenStreetMap in the background. And you can see that it's located. It's got all the text on and everything. So it's not, not ideal necessarily for viewing in a GIS, but it has located it correctly on the, in the world. And you can see where this PDF is located and, and, and interact with it. And if you need to trace features manually or whatever, you could do that in QGIS. So let's switch back to PowerPoint for a moment. So that's just a quick demo of what you can do by just ticking a box in QGIS. And we're going to go into more depth in a moment about other things you can do. Um, just as a little aside, um, you don't have to use something like Adobe Reader to view this and have this interactivity. There are a number of free or open source or both um, software that will allow you to do some of these features. They don't all allow you to do all of them. Um, XPDF and Evint, which are two major PDF readers on Linux, um, allow you to select layers and turn them on and off, which I think is really one of the key features of this is this flexibility to turn on and off the data you want and don't want. And also free um, PDF readers that aren't open source, but things like Boxit Reader um, allow you to do that as well. So we talked about creating PDFs and geo PDFs from QGIS, but sometimes you want to create them programmatically from some sort of vector data source without going through something like QGIS first. And you can actually create geo PDFs through GDAL, and you can create them using something called a XML composition file. And it's what you do is very simple. You write an XML file, which we'll come to in a moment, and then you run this command, gdal create, you give it the output file name, and then you give it a CO option, a creation option, saying the composition file is this XML file here. Now, interestingly, when I started this work about a year ago, um, you had to write your own Python script to use the gdal API to do this. Uh, my boss at the time actually sponsored uh, one of the GDAL core developers to add the GDAL create command, which is useful for various other tasks as well, but also has this extra ability that it does um, PDFs from XML composition files without you having to write your own code. 
And the kind of thing we're looking to produce is something like this. I was working on a naval project. Uh, we wanted to look at ship tracks over time. So these are two ships uh, traveling on the sea. We want to see where they are at what time, when they're close to each other, that kind of stuff, what they're doing, what, what, what position they're going in and, and speed they're going in and so on. Um, normally, this example would have a maritime chart in the background, but unfortunately, I've been told I wasn't allowed to share the maritime chart we had in our um, in this presentation. So I've replaced it with this artistic background that comes from the Stamen watercolour map. But you can see we've got two ships, Nelson and Collingwood, and we've got their tracks and some times mentioned and, and so on. Let's have a look at how we could create this using GDAL XML composition files. So it's an XML file. We start with a PDF composition element. And we can put in some stuff like some metadata, so who wrote it. And then we create a layer tree element, which lists all of the layers that we want to be available in that layers panel on the left-hand side. So here we've got a background chart. We've got the ship Nelson and the ship Collingwood. We then say we've got a page in our PDF. And we set the dots per inch and the width and the height. Now, dots per inch are normally left at 72 for this sort of stuff. And width and height, in this case, it's just the size of an A4 page in inches multiplied by 72. That's why it's those slightly funny numbers. We then set up the georeferencing. Now, in fact, you can have multiple different georeferences available in one PDF file. But here we're just using one. And we give it an ID of georeferenced and a, a coordinate system, in this case, uh, 4326, four, which is uh, WGS84 that long, um, and some control points to link the locations in the pay coordinate system to the locations in the geographic coordinate system. So here we're just saying that the coordinate 1, 1, it goes to a geographic coordinate of 50 north in latitude and minus 0 0.8 in longitude, and so on for the other four corners. You can do more complicated ways of doing this, but this is this is the easiest way of doing it. We then start the content tag, and we use this if layer on element, which says if the background layer is turned on, then show a raster called chart.tif and um, georeference it using this georeferencing information that we set up earlier. Nice and simple. We can then add some vector data as well. So here we're saying we want a vector data set that's nelson.shape uh, with its georeferencing. And then we give it an OGR style string. Now, this is something I didn't know anything about until I started this project, but GDAL can actually do basic vector styling. So here we're saying we want to style this vector as a symbol with a particular color and size, and the type of symbol is OGR symbol three, which we'll come to in a moment. We then add a logical structure tag saying, okay, this is the raw data that we want to be available. So when you query, uh, that layer, when you click on an, an entry in that layer, you can get up the information. This is what we get up, and we say that the key field to display is time. That will be the kind of identity field, because obviously each point in our data set is a different location of the ship over time. And this is the kind of output we get. They look like lines, but if you look closely, you can see they're just lots and lots of symbols very close together, which make it look kind of like a line. And if we look at our layers dialogue um, on the layers panel on the left, we've got the background chart, Nelson and Collingwood. Now we can do a bit better than this by doing a bit of pre-processing of the data. So first of all, we can take all the points and convert them into a line that just joins all the points together in the right order, like one of those dot to dot diagrams you might've done. Um, you can then extract points at various different point path, at various different stages along the line. So a point every hour, a point every 10 minutes, maybe the first point of the line. So we can all style these things differently. And then we can put together a different sort of XML file with a bit more complicated, still saying if the Nelson layer is turned on, then we'll add a vector data set of the points that are every 10 minutes all georeference and everything, and we'll use a symbol, this OGR symbol three, which is a circle. Then we'll add a vector label element. You have no idea how long it took me to debug the fact that my labels weren't appearing when I was using a vector element rather than a vector label element. Um, and it's Nelson hourly, so this is the hourly points, and we're going to label them. And the text here is given us curly braces time struct. So this is actually a field in the vector data, an attribute of the vector points, um, which has the string for that particular time. So we can label it with a particular time. And we've got a color, a size, and various different offsets and styling things for the, for the label. We can stick another label for the first point. So the first point of the data set needs to be labeled with the name Nelson. So we know which color is which 
ship. And then we can just add in the uh, vector of the line. So here we're drawing it with a pen, which just draws a line and it's five pixels wide and the same color as, as everything else. And if you look into the OGR vector styling, you find there's all sorts of options. It calls itself basic vector styling, but it's fairly comprehensive. You've got all sorts of different symbols you can use for polygons. You've got different fill styles for text. You've got angle and foreground and background and shadows and, and all sorts of things. So this is the kind of output you get. You get dots every 10 minutes. You get labels at the start of the line. You get time labels every hour and the two paths shown. But what if we take it a bit further than this? What if we take it a bit too far? Well, PDFs can actually have JavaScript in them. Everything can have JavaScript in it these days. Um, and it might strike you as a terrible idea, and in some ways it probably is, but you can put JavaScript into your PDF by using the JavaScript tags in a GDAL XML composition file. And the sort of JavaScript you might add might be something like this. This is something that adds a field to your PDF. Now, a field would normally be used for doing something like entering your name in a form, but we can have buttons as well. So this is a button located at a particular point. And we can say when the button's clicked, when the mouse comes up on that button, uh, run some particular JavaScript code. We can also get the different layers that are in our PDF by this function get OCGs. OCG stands for optional content groups, which is the official term for PDF layers. And we can turn these layers on or off by setting their state field to false or true. So if we split the track up into 15 minute chunks, we could then write an interesting PDF JavaScript function called next time step. And this has all been very simplified, but basically we get the next layer that isn't turned on and turn it on and update a few other things, update our index and so on. And that turns on the layer for the next time step. Now you may have come across the set interval function. It's the same function that's used in uh, web-based JavaScript. It runs a particular function at a particular time interval. So you can say run next timestamp every 1000 milliseconds, every one second. And you can guess what this is gonna do. This is gonna animate our track in a PDF. So let's have a look at this. And the example I'm gonna use here has gone even further. So this is our um, two ship tracks. We can use a button here to turn on interactive mode. And if we press play, you can see that our tracks animate and you can see how the two ships are moving in relation to each other. You can see when they get close to each other, when they almost pass each other, go across each other's track, go past each other, go round in corners and so on. You can pause it, you can go back in time, you can go forward in time and you can even scroll along all of this. And you've got the time appearing on the layers here. And if you want to go back from this, you can just go out of interactive mode and back to fully static mode. Uh, this all still works with all of the other things. So let's zoom in on the time, the place where they got very close to each other. Um, we can then turn on interactive mode. Um, let's go a bit further on. Oops. It's being a bit slow at the moment. There we are. So you can see we've got... Um, where the point at which they interact and we can go forward and backwards with our data there. Now this all works in the same way as it has done before. Also we can go um, from this back into QGIS again. We can um, query data points using the object data tool. We can measure things using the measurement tool all while we have this extra interaction on our PDF. Now if we go back here just a moment, there are some weird things about PDFs, but there are definitely some advantages of doing something this way. There's no need to install any other software. So this uses just Adobe Reader on most corporate networks that are often very locked down. Adobe Reader will already be installed. Um, it's still easily printable. You can zoom in or go to different time steps and print exactly what is seen. It's all contained in one file. You're not sending a load of shapefiles or a gear package plus an application plus a web viewer or anything like that. It's all one file, which is still interactive and can still be loaded back into GIS. And it has all these standard features that I showed you right to begin with, like identifying points and measuring and so on. So it's a bit crazy, but there's also a bit of method in our madness. 
And um, there are some very strange things about PDF JavaScript, I must say. Uh, the API is a bit weird. Uh, these are all real bits of code from my uh, JavaScript. Uh, you have to print a couple of things to the console to initialize the media component, otherwise it doesn't work. And that seems to be a suggestion people came up with online, and I don't know why it works, but it does. Uh, there's some different units that different things use. So the page view units are different to page units. And it seems like a factor of 0 0.732 converts between them. But I've no idea why. And that was found experimentally, which I'm not particularly encouraged by. And there's some very weird things about date passing. I tried to do some clever date passing uh, of the data in our files by, um, you know, this is a date format and this is a, a date. And you pass it into a date time object. And um, every time you run this function, you get a slightly different result, which is somewhat mad. Um, and there's all sorts of other things going on with this. Um, but in principle, it works, and it can give you amazing interactive applications remarkably simply. So in summary, QGIS can export to GeoPDF. Uh, basic GeoPDFs can be quite powerful. Just by ticking a box in QGIS, you get a lot of features for free. Uh, GDAL can create them, and GDAL can actually do styling, which I never knew. And you can even do this crazy JavaScript stuff if you really want to take it to the extremes to make it fully interactive. So thank you very much. Any questions? A lot of questions. <laughs> it, it was really hard for me to... <laughs> Why are you doing <laughs> this strange thing? Yes, uh, no, no, other questions. But uh, really great talk. I hope you have seen all the kudos that were flying around the slides. And look at the chat. It makes you really happy, I think. Um, so we start with the first question, which is maybe quite easy. How large is such a PDF compared to the standard geostorage formats? Um, not massive. Um, I mean, it is bigger. I mean, this one, this this possible G example that I gave of um, the, the airfields in the new forest was 1.5 megabytes. Now, I'm not sure how, I can't remember how big my original data was. My shapefile was probably very small. Um, but then I have got the QGIS data and so on. In fact, let me just very briefly export this while we're doing another question, maybe. I'll export this and... Um, and tell you how, how well, what the size difference is. Let's carry on with another question while I do that. OK, so the next one is, are there limitations on coordinate systems supported in PDFs? Uh, not as far as I'm aware. I haven't run into them myself. Um, we've done things in a, in a few different coordinate systems. And basically, anything that works in, in GDAL seems to work with um, seems to work fine for, for the GeoPDFs. I didn't have a problem with that. Okay, so the next one is, can the map be included in PDF document containing text and other static images as well? Um, I'm not sure. I think, I mean, you, you, there's, there's ways within the, within, the GDAL, um, within the GDAL composition file to specify some other things. I think you can probably import other PDFs. Um, and sort of put them on the page. So you can probably build up a full sort of PDF with some text and things as well. Um, I know definitely you can combine PDFs quite easily with a number of open source tools um, that would combine this as one page out of an, another document. So there's definitely ways around it, even if you can't do it fully within, within the GDAL tool. Um, and just to come back to the first question, I've just exported the um, example I gave with the airfields uh, without turning on the GeoPDF option, and the file size is pretty much the same, 1.5 megabytes for both of them. Um, so it's, I mean, that isn't really having much impact on it. I'm sure if you put a lot of vector data in there in lots of different layers, it will balloon the file size, um, but I don't imagine it's going to be a massive problem. Okay. I'm really sorry if I don't cope up with the votes on the on the questions. It's popping in and in. Uh, so which tools and software can be used to write the PDF JavaScript code? Um, so writing the JavaScript code is a bit of a pain. Um, the easiest way to do it is with the full professional version of Adobe Acrobat, um, which gives you um, a better interface for doing this. There's, there's nominal support for sort of debugging and breakpoints, but it's very weird and doesn't really work very well. So by far the easiest thing to do is to just um, stick a load of console.writeline 
commands in your in your JavaScript and um, print out what you're doing at various different points and try and debug it that way. Um, there is a big load of documentation for PDF JavaScript, uh, but you won't find much support for it on things like Stack Overflow. It's not it doesn't seem to be widely used by the kind of people who use Stack Overflow. Um, but the documentation comes as monster PDF files, as you might expect for PDF documentation. Uh, so you have to look through a 500 page PDF file to find what you want. But it is quite clearly documented um, when you work around the niggles for those sort of things that I showed you in, the, in one of the final slides. OK, the next one. What happens if you read an interactive PDF in an ill-equipped PDF reader. Um, so that's absolutely fine. So when I demonstrated uh, loading it in Preview in OSX, Preview doesn't understand interactive PDFs at all. Uh, it's just a built-in OSX uh, PDF reader, and it displays all the layers exactly how you've configured it in QGIS. Um, so just like it was a static PDF, it just doesn't give you the interactive ability. So it degrades beautifully. Good that you answer so fast. So we probably get all the questions through. <laughs> There's still a couple of them, so be prepared. We have five minutes left. Um, how are mm -hmm. the vector data stored within the PDF? If you GeoJSON or custom format, and what limitation does that create? Um, I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, there's there's probably a technical document somewhere explaining exactly how the internals of it work, uh, but I don't know. Um, but whatever it is, it seems to have worked so far with everything that I've thrown at it. So. Um, yeah, I guess it's some kind of standard geospatial format inside. It basically works as a kind of attachment to the PDF. Um, the PDF basically has kind of a file attached to it inside, and that file is is, is something that things like QGIS and GDAL can be, but I'm not entirely sure how it works. Okay, so the next one. The animation response speed seems a bit sluggish. What is the yes. reason for it? Um, so, so weirdly, it, it hasn't been before, really. Um, I think this was because I was sharing my screen on the streaming platform, and my laptop tends to get slow when you share your screen, because uh, it's an old laptop, and I'm waiting for the new ones to come out shortly. Um, it does get slow if you put a load of really fine-grained layers in. So if you say you want to split up your ship's track into one-minute segments, and then animate these one minute segments, it gets a bit slow because it's gonna have hundreds of layers that it's trying to turn on and off as you go through it. Um, but um, if I, it, it never went this slow before. I think it must've been the streaming that was the, that was the thing slowing everything down. So this is maybe a little bit complicated. Uh, as Geo PDFs are generated by GDL, is this function also available in Map Server? Um, I've never used Map Server, so I've no idea. But I imagine even if it isn't, um, if, if Map Server uses GDAL under the hood, then it probably could. But uh, you'd have to ask the Map Server devs about that, I'm afraid. Okay, no worries. Next question: <laughs> Have you ever run into security issues with any of your Geo PDFs and Geo PDFs with JavaScript? Um, I haven't. No. When I first heard about JavaScript being possible in PDFs, I thought, oh my goodness, this is a security issue just waiting to happen. Um, but it's quite limited in what you can do. It doesn't really let you do the kind of things that you'd want to do if, if you were trying to break out of the security sandbox. Um, so I haven't run into any problems. And in fact, this, this project was actually for the UK Navy. Uh, they've used these PDFs on their lockdown naval machines and not had any problems with it, it sort of saying you can't do this because of security. Um, so I think I think it must be fine. Okay, we have two minutes left, so some questions left. Can you load a PDF like this into a web browser? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, you can um, just load it as normal. It won't have um, the interactive functionality normally unless you've got a very fancy web browser with a very fancy built-in PDF component. Um, but um, yes, it will load fine in a degraded mode just as a static PDF. Robin, what JavaScript engine runs in the Adobe Reader? I have no idea, I'm afraid. <laughs> I was sure that this is the answer, but uh, we just dropped to the next one. Can you run async JS functions in PDFs, query remote databases, or static files? Uh, I don't think you can. Um, I'm pretty sure you can't query remote databases because it's part of the security sandbox thing. It, I don't think it lets you query arbitrary HTTP URLs or anything. Um, I don't think you get access to the local file system, but I think there are some ways around that if you're doing something like 
modifying the PDF and then saving it elsewhere or, or something. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can't do async. Uh, but again, it, it's possible that Adobe are going to release something that lets you do this soon. Who knows? And the last one, we are close. <laughs> I think this is a short answer as well. <laughs> Uh, they're awful. The JavaScript debugging tools. Um, supposedly, you could do breakpoints and and things, but just just use the equivalent of print statements. It, it, I tried using the other stuff, and it just wasn't worth it. Okay, I would just say cheers. This was a run. This was perfect. Thank you very much for your talk. No, thank you. And uh, I think many many people would love to have a beer with you <laughs> tonight. <laughs> But probably next Phosphor in Italy will be an opportunity. I thank you very, very much. I never posted through so many questions. I never had so many answers. That was really, really great. And uh, thank you very much for your talk. No, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Okay.